morning. Uh, scripture reading from Psalms 90, 10 to 14. Sorry. Uh, I had it right here. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of our, your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here today. If you're visiting with us, you are our honored guest, and we're so pleased that you have chosen to be with us today. Oh, okay, I did turn. <coughs> Gotta get out all my toys. I know. What would we ever do without it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Since the beginning of the year, we've been doing a series of lessons about Bible basics, coming to the Lord, the need to be saved. And if you're ever working with somebody who doesn't know the Lord, there's various times in which we need to lead people to a point of decision. The Bible is not just about knowing facts. Amen. It was never given to us just so we could win at a Bible trivia game. We are on the front of a spiritual battle for the very souls of individuals. We seek to want to get people to know the Lord. It should be a passion. Amen. And on top of that, we also want to make sure people are making an informed decision. Amen. Someone once said, Never be tempted to make a permanent decision based on a temporary circumstance. This is kind of an interesting spot for evangelists to be in. Because again, we want to share the gospel. We want people to be saved. We want people to make that decision. At the same time, we do not want people to make rash decisions. Amen. Because as we talked about last week, a journey of walking with the Lord can be started, and it can be started relatively easily, but at the same time, there are responsibilities with walking with the Lord that people are just not free to walk away from. So if you're in this situation where you're studying to be a Christian or you're looking to be a disciple of Christ, but you're not yet to that point of making a decision, okay, that, that's okay. But just remember, you got to make it. You know, this is how we've been trying to get people to do it. This is what we've been talking about since January. We've introduced God's word or the Bible. We introduced the idea that God, there is a God out there who loves you. There's a devil out there who hates you. There's a savior who can redeem you. Amen. Jesus Christ. We also talked about and try to get people to understand how this life starts. You need to hear the word of God so that you can be introduced. You need to be willing to believe that what the Bible says is true. You need to be willing to repent or turn away from the lives of sin with which we've led up to this certain point in our lives. 
We need to be willing to confess to ourselves and to others that, yes, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. And yes, I do need to humble myself into baptism and to, and to be willing to die with Christ so then I can live with Christ. But that doesn't stop there either. But we also go out and we live a faithful life for however long God allows us to be here. That's the path. That's the faithful life. But we also introduce the Christian living, the changes that we, may, that we need to make. We become devoted to God's word. We become devoted to God's people. We become devoted to the gathering. We become devoted to prayer. We become devoted to good works. This is what the Christian life is. Amen. And we're told before we make that decision so that people can be informed. We also talked about the price of this life, counting the cost. If you're willing to put on Jesus Christ and baptism, awesome. But are you willing to count the costs? Do we understand what this life costs? It's going to cost us our families, maybe. It's going to cost us some friends, definitely. But it's also going to cost us certain things that we might want in life. It's going to cost us the direction that our life might have been going. It's going to cost. Know that. It's going to cost. The question that we all need to answer individually is, is the cost worth it? But as we've also talked about, we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to God. We have responsibilities to the body. We have responsibilities if we're going to walk with the Lord. And we tell people this, and we share this with people at the first through a period of time, but at the first, hopefully before they make that decision, because it's a decision that they must make. And we don't want them to make a rash decision. We don't want them to make a decision based on emotion or based on just how good they feel at a specific time. They got excited and just made this decision. Think about what it is that we're doing. Amen. But at the other side of that coin, though, this is where it gets a little hard, and this is where, like, you know, I battle as well. It's also about that knowledge that life is short. Because it's a decision to walk with the Lord is a decision that must be made before Christ comes back and before we die. Or before we die, whichever comes first. How much time do you have? How much time do I have? So, some of us in the room, did you, have you expected to live as long on this planet as you have? You know, how, how long do we have? Life is short. You know, Jesus told us this. He told a story about it. If you look at Luke 12, verse 16 through 21, Jesus told a little parable about the rich fool. To which Jesus said in Luke 16, uh, excuse me, Luke 12, 16 through 21, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. It's a small parable, but the point is clear. How many people do we know, or maybe we ourselves, how many people strive in order to store up things for this life? There's going to come a day with which we're not going to be here. Do we understand that? Life is short. And everything in our house that we put so much joy in, it's either going to the dump, going to Goodwill, 
are going in a garage sale. And we won't be able to say anything about it. Life is short, and the things that we have on this life cannot save us. But it's a repeated theme. Be, life being short is a repeated theme. Just as an example, in James chapter 4, verse 14, it says, What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Psalm 39, verse 5 says, Behold, you have made my days few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Proverbs 27, verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. James 1, verse 11 says, For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. God created the world with no death. Death did not enter the scene until sin did. And so you can read this fascinating chapter uh, in Genesis, which talks about these long lives that people had. And people get blown away and still debate. Did people really live? Did Methuselah really live 969 years and on and on and on and on? It's like, that's not the point. Those long years are not the point. You know what the point of that chapter is? The repeated line. And then he died. Amen. That's the point. Again and again and again. Someone lived 700 years. Someone lived 800 years. Someone lived 900 years. And then he died. Death comes to us all because of sin. We don't know when it's coming. We don't know how long we have. And we don't plan for it. A lot of us. I love the first Thor movie made back in 2011. There's a scene in there which Thor is talking uh, to the gatekeeper of Asgard by the name of Hemdal. And Thor wants to go on this dangerous mission. And Hemdal tells him, he's like, look, I can send you there. But if you put yourself in a position where you make Asgard dangerous or somebody or, you know, we're going to be in danger because of your actions, I cannot open my gate to you. Or if you're dying, I cannot open my gate to you. And Thor says, I have no plans to die today. And Hemdal says, none do. Who plans on dying today? What was that? No take. Well, about to say, if you drove to church today and you raised your hand, I was going to say, don't ride with them. <laughs> Nobody plans on it. Unless maybe you, you have some sort of illness like a cancer or something. You know, you're not planning on it. But it's going to happen. And it's not always going to happen in the time and the place of our choosing. Are you, am I, ready to meet the Lord today? But again, it's not just death that's going to make this meeting happen. It's also the second coming. Because again, our existence on this planet will end one of two ways. Christ comes back or we die. Those are it. If you flip over to Mark 13, in Mark 13, verse 32, Jesus tells another story. In verse 32, it says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Now, again, the idea of this watching is not to predict the second coming. That's not the point. We'll talk more about that here in a little bit. The point is, and the idea of watching, live the life. Be obedient. 
do the things God would have us do. That's the idea of watching. And when Christ comes back, I pray I'm doing something for the Lord or I'm sleeping. Amen. Because that's the idea. And again, this, this suddenness of the second coming is again a repeated biblical theme. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, we're told, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Revelation 16, excuse me, Revelation 16, verse 15 says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen and exposed. Luke chapter 12, verse 40 says, You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We're not going to expect Christ coming back when it happens. Odds are, even for those of us who know Christ is coming back eventually, when it actually happens, there's going to be surprise. Oh, that's happening today. Okay. Because again, people have tried to predict it. And people insist on trying to predict it. And it doesn't work. It never works. Because we're still here. You know, there was something that happened in 1843. It has become known as the Great Disappointment. In 1843, there was a preacher who was telling uh, his congregation that Christ was going to come back on this specific date in 1843. And so by the, end of, by the time that day approached, there were 100,000 followers of this guy throughout the nation who have sold their things and you know, quit their jobs and were residing on hillsides, very much like what happened in uh, First and Second Thessalonians, by the way, waiting for Christ to come back. And so they gathered together on the morning of that day, and they started waiting, and there was much cheering, and then the hours started going by. And God bless them. Some of them stayed until midnight, and nothing happened. Some of them left the faith because of that. Other people returned to the church because they just didn't know what to do. The guy who actually predicted it kind of faded away, and it became a huge mess. 2011, we had a couple of dates that were given to us. You know, that was a big year. That was another, you know, big time of big disappointment. Actually, I mean, we were in New Mexico when this happened, and I remember uh, hearing from uh, a member, they had a friend who had family that were trying to sue the organization because they had a relative who sold all their stuff and gave it to the church. And then this happened, nothing happened. People are still trying to buy into it. You know, again, we had one last year, you know, uh, September 19th, 2020. These things tend to happen around my son's birthday. I don't know what that means. But um, <laughs> in fact, you know, I joke about it. There was actually an end of the world prediction on the very day my son became a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, people are still trying to predict it. It doesn't work. The date of Christ coming back is not for us to know. And if anybody ever tell, tries to tell you, I know when it's going to happen, get away from them. They are dangerous people. No one knows. It's not for us to know. It's for us to be ready. If Christ came back today, are you, am I, ready to meet the Lord? Another certainty that the Bible gives us is that we will all face the judgment. All of us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. See, that's the thing, and, and, and don't be, it, it's, it's easy, it's tempting to think, well, if I put on Christ in baptism, and if I walk with the Lord, I'm going to skip the judgment day and just get the reward. No. We all will face the judgment. You know, it's like, think of, think of it this way. If someone was, was, um, was believed to have committed a crime, they have to stand before the judge. And during the trial, if the evidence comes out and the guy is deemed innocent, he still has to stand before the judge in order for the judge to say, you're innocent. So regardless of how that meeting's going to go, we will all still stand before God. And God will judge us. That's part of who he is. That's his role. He's able to do it. And again, this is a repeated biblical theme. And also these, these scriptures that I'm showing you on these, this, this isn't all of them. This is just as many as I could fit on a slide. But again, the Bible is filled with these things. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Matthew 12, verse 36 says, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every, this one scares me, every careless word they speak. Now, if you're a witty, sarcastic person like myself, pay attention to this one. A day is going to come in which we have to give an account for every careless word we speak. <coughs> Acts 17, verse 31 says, Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Romans 2, verse 16 says, On that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. A month or so ago, I showed you some uh, statistics, which shows that, you know what? We live in a world today in which we're getting close to about half of people who profess themselves to be Christians do not believe in the second coming, do not believe that there's going to be a judgment, do not believe that there's going to be punishment, do not believe in hell, do not believe in the devil, and so forth. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible repeatedly teach? One day. I don't know that day. Neither do you. Neither did Jesus. On, but on that day, we will be judged. And on that day, are you, am I, ready to face God's judgment? As most of you know, I started doing uh, insurance with Sherry on a part-time basis. And so I'm, I've been able to spend some time with people who have been in this industry longer than I am, and I'm already starting to hear stories. One of the people we work with in town, he was in a situation where he was trying to uh, sell a life insurance policy to this couple, and the couple just, you know, the, the wife wanted it, but the husband didn't. And he just, you know, he just shut it down. He just shut it down. We don't need it. We don't need it. We don't need it. We don't need it. Single income home. We don't need it. He was the, the breadwinner for the family. We don't need it. We don't need it. Two months later, he died. The wife calls the agent because he's a friend of the family. Help me. You know what the thing about life insurance is? You have to buy it before you die. And this tore our coworker apart because he felt for them. Again, he knew them. And so he's scrambling, he's thinking, and before he started selling insurance, he was selling funeral policies for a local uh, funeral home, so he knew some people. He says, okay, okay, it's like, okay. Let, 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 me, let me make some calls. Let me see what, what kind of deals or whatever. Let me see if I can find somebody that can, that can help you, maybe you give you a discount, and, and, and let's see. 
But regardless, single income home, his income's gone. Now she's having to figure out how to carry on. And at the day of the funeral, it's too late to think about what we're going to do. And it's the same thing with our relationship with Christ. Because I've heard ministers talk as well. And I've experienced this. When I see Christ come back, then I'll change. <laughs> Listen to me very carefully. It doesn't work like that. A couple of weeks ago, Charlene Trussell, is she here? No. no. Okay. Charlene told a story that she had a friend of hers that goes to another church down here. And they were having like a, a seminar lectureship type day. And one of the classes that was offered was this. How to defend yourself to God at your judgment. Listen to me very carefully. <laughs> it doesn't work like that either. The time that we have been given to think about our relationship with Christ is today. Because we need to avoid Kicking the can down the road. Again, we want people, and again, hear me, because again, it, it is kind of a weird thing. We need people to understand life is short, eternity is long, and one day Christ is going to come back, and we don't know when it's going to happen. You need to think about these things. While at the other side, it is completely true. We don't need you to make a rash decision. We don't need you to make a commitment to, the God, to God that you know in your heart of hearts that you're not going to keep. Because that doesn't do you any good either. So what, are we, so what are we trying to say? What do we want to do? What's the mission? You need to think about this. Amen. What's not allowed is to just kick the can down the road. Or some of you might have been familiar with kicking the rock down the road. Whatever the case may be. But the idea is you're walking down a path and you see a can. And you're by yourself. You don't have iPods and you're not doing anything. So you just kick it. And it can goes you know, down the road. You walk up to it after a period of time and you kick it again. The idea behind the saying is, well, I'll just put it off to a more convenient time. And when that time gets here, I'll think about it then. What happens? No, we're not. We get to that point where it comes into our head again and we say, okay, well, I'll worry about it later. And just repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. Ad nauseum until we come to our time to die. And then we think to, myself, to ourselves, oh my God, I wish I had more time. People mock God. People call Christ a liar. When I was researching this lesson, I came across the title of, a, of an article that said Jesus Christ was a liar because he hasn't come back yet. <laughs> he hasn't come back yet is the key word. We don't know when it's happening. But what Satan wants us to do is to drown out our sensibilities to the point where we're not looking for it anymore, we're not watching anymore, and we're not thinking about it anymore. We have been given this time and place to make a decision. If you're working with people in the scripture, this is important. You've got to bring the people to a point of decision, Amen. to a point of challenge. To not let them sit back and just reside in the, okay, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Okay, there's only so long that we can think about something before we either act on it or it fades away. We need to avoid the putting off of the decision. Now, if you're in a study or you're, or you're contemplating these things, and again, you feel like you're, you're not quite ready yet, you're still counting the cost, you want to make it a good decision. Okay, we, we get that. We do. We understand it. But again, the idea is you want to make your good decision, fine. 
But don't take 10 years to do it. You might say, well, I don't want to disappoint God. With walking with the Lord, running's allowed, jogging's allowed, walking's allowed, crawling is allowed, and, you know, inchworming is allowed. Having a bad day and, and sinning unintentionally, taking a couple steps back, you know, that's allowed too. If you're willing to get back on the horse and fix the relationship. But you know what's not allowed? Quitting. Amen. Walking with the Lord, you're going to have your good days, you're going to have your bad days, you're going to have your okay days, you're going to have your mediocre days. There's going to be times in your life that you and God are going to be tight. There's going to be times in your life you're going to be tempted to give up and give in. There's going to be times in your life that your faith is strong. There's going to be times in your life where you're wondering where God is. There's going to be times in your life where you're going to have success and victory over a variety of sins. There's going to also probably be times in which you stumble in a sin or two. And you know what? God can work wonders with people who are striving to follow him and to repent and confess and to turn away from the sins that come into their lives. Amen. But when people quit the life and turn away, There's not much God can do unless that person turns back. The point of today was to not get people to just rush to the baptistry. Because again, remember, don't, you know, don't make a permanent decision based on a temporary circumstance. But just know, if you are not walking with the Lord, you do need to think about these things. If you're not walking with the Lord, every day that passes is a day closer to your death and a day in which you stand before Christ. Amen. Time works on us all. And if you have not worked with the Lord and, and, you're, and you're in the midst of a study, are you thinking about these things? Do not kick the can down the road and think about it later. Amen. We have today. How is your relationship with God? I don't know, but you do. Are you ready to face the Lord? This morning, we'd like to offer the invitation to those of you, maybe you want to become a disciple of Christ. Maybe you do, but again, you want to make an informed decision. We get that. We encourage that. Because too many times, people have rushed up here to be baptized. They get baptized, and then we don't see them again. This is something we're trying to avoid. But if you're ready to make an informed decision about your relationship with God, we would love to assist you in your baptism. If you don't know the Lord and you would love to know the Lord, let us know and we can drop you in a Bible study. We can walk with you so that you can think about these things. Because this is the thing, and I tell people this you know, when, when I'm working with them. You know, your baptism, you know, I, that, that's something that we're trying to lead you to. We're trying to lead you to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But it's not for me. It's not for me. I get excited when this happens, but the reality is, is that it's not for my glory. And it's not for the glory of anybody else in this church. At the end of the day, the relationship with Jesus Christ is going to be about you and Jesus Christ, first and foremost. So don't do it for, for the preacher. Don't do it for your spouse. Don't do it for your parents. Don't do it for your brothers and your sisters. Don't do it for your friends. Don't do it for any of that stuff. Because at the end of the day, it is going to be up to you individually to maintain a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that. Now again, we can help you. We can guide you. We can mentor you. We can do all that. But at the end of the day, it's about you and Christ. If, you, if there's anything you need, please come down as we stand and as we sit.